subscribe to our YouTube channel and press the bell icon to get the latest updates. The world over its history has seen more than 25 extinction events including the one that's ongoing right now called the Holocene extinction event that has been triggered by human induced changes to the environment. Of all of these historic extinction events, five are the biggest and these are categorized as the major extinction events. We are all familiar with the most recent one, of course, which was the Cretaceous Paleogene extinction event, and that's the one that killed off the dinosaurs. But that was not the most destructive or the largest extinction event in history. That honor belongs to the end Permian or the Permian Triassic extinction event that occurred 252 million years ago. This event killed off 90% of all marine animals and 75% of all terrestrial animals. We know how this occurred and what triggered this mass extinction, but new findings offer more clues as to the mechanism of action of how all of these species went extinct during this mass extinction. I'm Sandhya Ramesh and this is Pure Science. The Permian Triassic extinction event is also known as the Great Dying. It occurred about 252 million years ago. When it occurred, it wiped out 57% of all biological families and 83% of all genera. It is also thought to have wiped out about 90% of all insects. It occurred over a period of about 50 to 60,000 years. We think that the event, the mass extinction event, actually occurred in one to three pulses of extinction events. The patterns of extinction are interesting. Marine invertebrates are the ones that suffered the most. We can see from fossils that were discovered in China that barely a handful of marine invertebrate genera survived this mass extinction. Mainly, creatures that had exoskeletons and ones which depended on external carbon dioxide to produce their calcium carbonate shells, those were the ones that went very quickly extinct and disappeared. This is of course because of ocean acidification which we know is caused by increased atmospheric carbon dioxide which then causes the oceanic waters to become more acidic. This then of course destroys calcium carbonate shells. Creatures that lived on the seafloor called benthic organisms had the maximum loss of species. This mass extinction is also the only known extinction event which involved large extinctions of insect populations. Because insects are so resilient and they also have such high populations in terms of just sheer numbers, they are usually hardy and resistant to mass extinction events. The largest insects went extinct first and those insects with piercing parts and suckers also reduced greatly in diversity. Nearly two-thirds of all animals on land disappeared. Largest herbivores declined the most and amphibians and reptiles and even early mammals all suffered losses. Overall, animals that had high metabolic rates and also well-developed respiratory systems as well as animals that were free of calcium carbonate shells were the ones that showed propensity to survive this mass extinction event. When it comes to plants though, it's a little difficult to tell. Plants are generally thought to be resistant to mass extinction events in general, but when such large numbers of animals and whole species and families disappear altogether, there tends to be typically a rearrangement within the ecosystem because feeding patterns change, plant abundances change, and sometimes forests can fully disappear, which we thought is what happened during this mass extinction. Fossil records indicate that forest and wooded regions were slowly replaced by herbs and shrubs. So once again, it's the larger plants that started to decline. Overall though, in terms of just life, the destruction was selective, which meant that some environmental factors affected some kinds of plants and animals much more than the other kinds. Identifying the precise cause with certainty for this extinction event has been difficult due to lack of evidence. There's also the fact that the sea floor is completely recycled every 200 million years or so by lava and all of the evidence in rocks from 50 million years before that is entirely lost. 
There was widespread ocean anoxia, which means lack of oxygen in the ocean. There was also ocean acidification because of increased carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. Coinciding with the extinction is also a global decrease in the ratio of stable isotope of carbon-13 to that of carbon-12. This can actually be seen in rocks and is sometimes used as a marker for the end Permian extinction event. We also know enough of Earth's geological history to know what was happening at the time that this mass extinction event took place. This was when the Siberian traps were erupting. The earth was not in its modern form, the continents were not arranged the way they were today. There was still Pangaea at the time, the last big supercontinent, so all land masses were attached together, surrounded by the open ocean. Now, traps are areas of large volcanic formations or provinces, and they're usually formed by very slow basaltic flow events. The other famous traps that we know of are, of course, Deccan traps that we've spoken of multiple times before. Back in the end Permian, the Siberian traps had begun erupting and this is one of the largest known volcanic events on Earth. The lava that came out of this basaltic flow spread out over an area of over 2 million square kilometers, forming new land. But this volcanism also emitted large amounts of carbon dioxide and hydrogen sulfide and other toxic greenhouse gases that we know come out during volcanism. And the emission would also have blocked out sunlight. It would have dispersed all of these gases globally in the form of even acid aerosols and also dispersed them over the ocean and into the water. This would have caused things like acid rain, but also just the mere act of blocking out sunlight would have caused many food chains to collapse cascadingly. The emissions would have raised global temperatures and this global warming would have persisted for millions of years. And here is where the new findings come into picture. Researchers from US, China, Canada and Switzerland collaborated to perform nickel isotope analyses on sedimentary rocks that are from the Permian time period, which were obtained from the Arctic Canada. They discovered upon performing their analysis that these rocks had the lightest isotope ratios ever measured. So they concluded that the nickel rich particles were actually aerosolized and dispersed globally from volcanoes and then this then entered the ocean. An increase in this trace metal would have increased the number of bacteria that produce methane, which would have in turn harmed any life that was dependent on oxygen. This data now shows a direct link between global dispersion of nickel-rich aerosols, chemistry changes in the ocean, as well as the mass extinction event itself. So the findings now actually show the sequential connection between various things like flood basaltic volcanism and oceanic anoxia and mass extinction. And more specifically, it identifies what the authors describe as a specific kill mechanism. Recovery from this extinction event was slow as it is with all events. Some organisms that survived the extinction event itself continued to decline subsequently and went extinct thousands and maybe even millions of years after the extinction event. The results are slightly conflicting in terms of numbers. Some think that it took about 10 million years for life to recover because of the severity of the event, as well as the really hostile and unfavorable conditions that persisted after the event. But some experts think that life actually recovered pretty quickly within just 2 million years instead of 10 million. So the extinction was also likely less severe in some areas as compared to other areas. Starting from this extinction event, we can now start to identify ancestors of modern animals. Newer animals that started to take over the sea floor were things like snails and sea urchins. Fish started to multiply in the open ocean and diversified as well, so did reptiles. Before the extinction event, more than two-thirds of the animals in the ocean were sessile, which means they were attached to the floor or to rocks or some surface and then rose up and floated about like an antenna. But after the extinction event, only half the marine creatures were sessile, the rest were free living. On land, we started to see the rise and the rapid diversification of dinosaurs. 
some mammals also started to appear. The Lystrosaurus, which was a herbivore just about the size of a pig, became the most dominant animal on land and it made up about in fact 90% of all land animals. As dinosaurs started to take over land in what was called the Triassic takeover, mammals were in fact forced to remain small and nocturnal and feed on insects. This actually was an advantage for mammals because it contributed to the development of fur and high metabolic rates. But overall, still, land vertebrates took a long time to recover, about 30 million years, and overall marine diversity reached pre-extinction levels only about 75 million years after the extinction event. Since then, of course, we've had more mass extinction events and were even causing one. The main takeaway from these findings is actually the value of nickel isotope analysis. This is an emerging field and this was one of the major findings that was done using this method. So geoscientists are pretty hopeful that going forward, we can now learn more about the world and solve some of our geological mysteries using this method in the future.